so hello everybody and welcome to the Global Water Futures Science Exchange in, in Manitoba. Uh, my name is Stephanie Merrill and I am a Knowledge Mobilization Specialist with the Global Water Futures Program based at the University of Saskatchewan. So right before the pandemic hit, we had started a series of meetings to focus on research updates as they relate to water management challenges of the different regions across the country. We started in Edmonton, Alberta, and today we're restarting this tour here in Manitoba. We had hoped to be in person, but maybe we will be able to do that again soon. I thank you for joining us, and I hope that you and your families are doing as well as you possibly can. For those of you who may be new to Global Water Futures, Global Water Futures is the world's largest university-led water research program, and it's a partnership between the University of Saskatchewan, University of Waterloo, McMaster, and Wilfrid Laurier. We're at the, seven, the halfway point of a seven-year program to advance the science needed to better forecast, prepare for, and manage water futures in the face of dramatically increasing risks from climate change. Working with water practitioners like yourselves, in governments, industries, civil society, indigenous communities and governments guide us and enable us to do better work to connect our science and evidence into water programs, decisions and policy developments. Today, we're gonna to focus on updates that we think will be of interest to water managers working on the complex water issues in Manitoba. In the short time that we have today, we'll not be able to cover everything of interest, but we hope that this will help to maintain engagement between researchers and practitioners for further discussions and collaborations. Some quick logistics. We'll be here for about 90 minutes. There is closed captioning available in English, and you can find that and turn it on in the toolbar on the bottom of your screen. We're recording this event and we will share. Please stay muted and with your cameras off for the duration of the presentations. When we get to the question and answer period, we encourage you to use the reaction function to raise your hand to indicate to me that you may like to ask a question. Otherwise, you can also feel free to throw questions in the chat box and we will try to answer some of those there and use some to pose live to researchers. So I want to officially begin by acknowledging that today's meeting and all of the research and work that will be discussed today are focused on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, the Cree, the Oji Cree, Dakota and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge the importance of the lands and the waters that draw us together here today and which provide a focus for positive and fruitful discussions on how to steward them for better health for all generations to come. I've posted the agenda in the chat box if you feel free to follow along. So we'll get started right now with a introductory, introductory presentation by Dr. John Pomeroy, who holds the Canada Research Chair in Water Resources and Climate Change and is a distinguished professor at the University of Saskatchewan, where he directs the Global Water Futures Program. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Stephanie, and uh, uh, delighted that you could all join us uh, today for this. I will uh, set up my uh, screen here, but the, um, uh, the Manitoba is extremely important for global water futures because so many of the really challenging water problems in Canada are manifest in Manitoba. The, uh, you've been subject to uh, massive water quality problems, land management, river basin management issues, flooding, uh, and now drought. As, as well as you've also been a beacon to the rest of the country uh, for how you deal with these uh, water crises and how you have come together as a province in finding uh, better ways to manage your water and uh, now looking towards a water strategy for the province, a renewed water strategy. But, uh, but groups uh, uh, such as the uh, uh, Southern uh, uh, Reeves and Mayors and First Nations coming together again in Treaty 1 uh, to look at how they'll, they'll do things, the uh, development of capacity and water resources in the Manitoba government and the uh, with the river basin councils and then 
the work Manitoba Hydro does, which is very sophisticated in uh, estimating uh, stream flows and managing its water, as well as the uh, many First Nations that have uh, had uh, tremendous challenges with their water supplies in Manitoba and have come together and, and uh, look for solutions and also shown how a more holistic approach uh, to water management uh, might be envisioned. So uh, Manitoba is, uh, is an important uh, place for global water futures. The, um, the program itself was formed in 2016 uh, through a grant from the Canada First Research Excellence Fund. Um, it's, uh, there are four pr primary partner universities in it, Saskatchewan, Waterloo, McMaster, and Laurier, uh, but also uh, a total of 18 universities across the country, including the University of Manitoba, which has had a, a fundamental role in uh, driving this forward. The uh, Global Water Futures uh, has overall goals of improving the Canadian economy and and uh, uh, quality of life, uh, but also bringing Canada to the forefront of research. But its mission focuses on, on three things. And one is improving disaster warning uh, to providing better science so we can understand and uh, provide better warnings for floods, droughts, water quality episodes uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the country. The second is to predict water futures, to better predict the status of our water on a uh, decadal and century uh, time frame, uh, its quantity, its quality, its use, um, and how we might better manage it. And then the third is a massive component of the program, and that is to help Canadians better adapt to changes in their water as, as, as the climate changes, as land use changes, as development changes, and how to manage water-related risks. And, um, and so you'll see a, a couple of photographs here, but the one in the center is in the Red River Valley two years ago when I was driving across and uh, there is a bit of flooding in Southern Manitoba. So um, uh, tremendous challenges uh, in dealing with flooding in, in that particular valley, but other parts of the province as well uh, because of the mild topography and because you're downstream of everyone. So that uh, puts you in an interesting situation. Global Water Futures has uh, grown over the last few years to now encompass 64 projects and core teams uh, at those 18 universities uh, with 189 faculty investigators uh, funded by the program. Um, almost 500 partners have signed up with Global Water Futures in various ways and we have an active user uh, advisory committee that is chaired by Manor Tobin. Um, many publications and presentations coming out of the program and we've hired almost 1,000 uh, HQP, highly qualified personnel. By that, I mean students and uh, researchers and, and uh, technicians and, and fellows and others. A number of observatories across the country, including in Manitoba, and uh, a lot of our research emanates from uh, experiences with South Tobacco Creek and collaborations there and collaborations at Broughton's Creek and, and elsewhere. We tie in internationally to four global programs uh, based out of the UN, the World Meteorological Organization, uh, UNESCO's International Hydrological Program, the World Climate Research Program, and Future Earth. And the uh, program has grown from its original allotment from the CFREF of uh, 77.8 million with substantial contributions, both cash and in kind from our partners and uh, provincial governments and other organizations. At, at midterm, uh, you know, we, we design global water futures around three pillars, one being diagnosing and predicting change, the second uh, developing big data decision support systems, you'll see all that here. The third is designing user solutions, uh, solutions with the users, and so it's, it's a very transdisciplinary project. And uh, so you'll see a lot of that in the uh, presentations and discussions here. Uh, uh, things that we're very proud of uh, to work on so far are uh, we've uh, advanced our water predictions in a number of river basins across the country under climate change. We've uh, developed the principles for operational flood forecasting system development and have some done some pilot implementations across the country. Uh, we've been co-creating freshwater research solutions with 76 indigenous communities across the country. We have 60 water observatories. The um, We've uh, work to define how water, society, health, equity, diversity, and inclusion fit together in a very specific way for water science. 
and we've been working with uh, MP Terry uh, Duguid, who's Parliamentary Secretary for the Canada Water Agency, offering visions for what that agency might do. Um, uh, projects doing fascinating work on invasive species using environmental DNA to detect their presence, and, um, and almost 500 uses, as I mentioned. Um, of those 64 projects and core teams, here are a few that are of particular relevance uh, to Manitoba. You'll hear from some of these projects, but due to the limitations of time, not all of them, but uh, uh, tremendous work being done. And each of these projects has multiple investigators, multiple universities, and a number of students and postdocs and other researchers working on them. So uh, tremendous stuff going on. We have developed an Indigenous Community Water Research Strategy, which I mentioned, and that started by a meeting on, at the uh, Six Nations Territory back in 2018 at our first meeting, meeting in Wanuskewin, and a number of regional meetings across the country with First Nations where we listen, we co-develop, and, um, and we try to help build uh, with them, build capacity in the communities uh, for the serious water problems, but also the tremendous environmental knowledge that First Nations hold <coughs> that can help uh, Canada as a whole solve its water problems. We've been trying to communicate the science in ways other than graphs and charts. And one way to do that is through art. And so through the our artists in residence, Gennady Ivanov and the Virtual Water Gallery, uh, we've been able to uh, portray uh, the science and the issues in uh, new ways. And, you see the artistic representation from the men who paint of the Saskatchewan Nelson Basin to Hudson Bay is one way to do that. We've uh, developed uh, core teams that have a coupled water observation, data management, water prediction and knowledge mobilization strategy. Uh, that's setting up predictions over 5 million square kilometers of Canada, uh, larger than the European Union. Uh, that's our 60 data water observatories across the country, a, um, a massive data management system, the development of GWF net for data management and working with other agencies on that, um, our knowledge mobilization, such as the research impact profiles and other aspects uh, such as this meeting uh, have helped us to do that. We have a very large core modeling team of over 40 modelers and uh, are developing our, and running our models on supercomputers across the country. Um, one aspect that I wanted to highlight before we move into this that underpins a lot of the climate change simulation are the regional climate simulations from Global Water Futures. We've been uh, doing these in collaboration with the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. And the most recent one coming out is a four kilometer resolution convective permitting regional climate simulations for the current and late 21st century climate. That four kilometer resolution is unprecedented for the continent and uh, gives us very high veracity uh, to our climate simulations, particularly for precipitation and extremes of precipitation, which we need uh, for various work. And so that uh, larger domain uh, will be coming out later this year and we'll be making that publicly available as well. The, uh, some of the simulations so far um, out of CONUS are quite disturbing when we look at the uh, uh, future under RCP 8.5, about eight degrees of warming. And if you look at Manitoba, where Manitoba sits in this warming, it's in the heart of it. Um, it's in the upper end of that, uh, so eight plus to 10 uh, for Manitoba. So uh, lots of changes in the climate and lots of changes in precipitation patterns as well that would be difficult to cope with. But uh, we'll be talking about that and I'll wrap up there and we'll get into the session. So thank you so much and uh, look forward to our deliberations today. Thanks, John. That's a, that's a good place to introduce uh, Ron Stewart, who will be talking a little bit more about uh, the climate trends. So Ron Stewart is a professor in the Department of Environment and Geography at the University of Manitoba and he's the co-principal investigator of the Climate-Related Precipitation Extremes Project. I'd like to talk briefly about climate-related precipitation extremes. Uh, we're working with a number of partners from agriculture, electrical utilities, engineering and design, and insurance to help them better cope with such extremes in the current and future climate. 
types of phenomena that we're looking at are shown here in the interest of in, in the interest of time i'll only talk a little bit about the ones i indicate here manitoba of course is no stranger to extremes it's currently experiencing a significant drought as we speak drought is been studied for a long time over the Canadian prairies, and there are many studies such as shown on the upper right-hand side. We're here we're looking at a measure of dryness, the SPEI, as a function of time under a business as usual scenario over the Canadian prairies. The current climate which steps between wet and dry is expected to be dominated by dry in the future. But you can also look at drought from the perspective of an individual event. And all droughts go through a period of growth, persistence, and retreat. And will these characteristics change in some matter in the future? We looked at this with 29 GCMs. And we looked at two periods in the future, the mid and the far future, we defined them as. And we learned a number of things about future droughts. First of all, we expect that there will be an increase in the actual number of droughts. And furthermore, the duration of each is also expected on average to increase as well. And most of the increase in duration is actually from longer persistence. The actual growth and retreat may very well shorten. In other words, the drought can actually develop into a severe one very quickly. And furthermore, it may end very quickly as well. And on average, the drought in the future is expected to be more severe than it currently is. And they add this substantial variation between the models and that variation, of course, needs to be reduced in the future. Another issue which is important uh, from the water perspective uh, through freeze thaw, and it's also from the hazardous precipitation perspective in terms of things like wet snow and freezing rain is what the temperatures are. Uh, a number of these occur, they all occur, I should say, very close to zero degrees Celsius. So what is our current distribution of temperature from Winnipeg. Looking at the blue line in our current climate, the most commonly occurring temperature is approximately plus 12 degrees Celsius or plus 16, something of that order. On the other hand, there's still a secondary peak around zero degrees Celsius. Now in the future, we've applied the pseudo-global warming simulations discussed earlier with the warmth simulations. And what is predicted is that temperatures in Winnipeg will increase by approximately 6.3 degrees Celsius. So what does the temperature distribution look like uh, under those conditions? Well, it actually looks very similar. In this case, the most commonly occurring temperature is about plus 24. On the other hand, there's still uh, temperatures occurring near zero forms a secondary peak. So even though it's gonna warm up so much, we're not necessarily getting rid of those many different processes, phenomena occurring right around zero. And this can actually impact something like the catastrophic 2019 snowstorm, which a number of people in the audience would have experienced. It produced the largest Winnipeg October snowfall on record. And furthermore, its track was rare. As a matter of fact, we haven't seen anything like this. Uh, the track was almost due south to north looped around Lake of the Woods before proceeding to the east. And that left wet and sticky snow, strong northerly winds, and temperatures hovering very close to zero across southern Manitoba for a very long time. It's had a big impact on ecosystems, had a big impact on homes and businesses, and for Manitoba Hydro, it led to unparalleled damage restoration issues. Uh, phenomena, the storm is made worse in terms of its impacts by the fact the leaves were still on the trees. And furthermore, the lakes had a major role as well. And that strong northerly winds, precipitation was enhanced down the end. And those warm lakes also acted to maintain temperatures just above zero to the south. So any precipitation that fell was very wet and sticky compared to uh, vegetation. And they add, maybe not so much in this particular event, but other events that can be made significantly worse by proximity to even our very low topography. Uh, this is very important. So a simple summary, and I repeat the word simple, of our current insight regarding change within our project. 
as we saw earlier, drought is expected to increase. In terms of conductor precipitation, uh, including hail, by the end of the century, the far future, this is expected to decrease. Unfortunately, the reason for that is because drought has become so pervasive. In the interim, uh, it may very well be that significant convection is actually going to increase before it uh, is uh, reduced uh, due to the presence of drought. And we also just saw the talk about near zero degrees Celsius and related issues. Uh, there's still, because of that, there's quite a bit of uncertainty as to what may happen. There are projections of freezing rain being more or less unchanged over southern parts of the province, or other ones have actually shown somewhat of an increase. And I think the jury is still out in terms of wet snow, and it's a study we'll be soon undertaking ourselves. Of course, these will undoubtedly be updated somewhat, and we certainly have to prepare ourselves for surprises uh, as well. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, so we'll move on to an update by um, Dr. Trish Stadnick. Uh, she is an associate professor in the Department of Geography at the University of Calgary. She's an investigator within the Global Water Futures core modeling team and with the Integrated Modeling Program for Canada. So good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be able to uh, see you all again. Uh, for those uh, that know me, I spent about 12 years in Manitoba and only recently moved to the University of Calgary. Of course, I moved upstream, but I am still in the same watershed, um, which is kind of a neat, neat thing to think of. I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about the work that's going on with IMPC or the Integrated Modeling Program for Canada. <clears throat> this program is led by Dr. Uh, Simon Razavi and Carl Eric Lindenschmidt. Uh, you'll hear from Carl later on. He's going to be talking about some rubberized processes. So I today will be talking to you about IMPC. I'm the I'm one of the collaborators on IMPC and I'm co-leading themes A5 and B1. I also lead the development of the water resources management team within the GWF core modeling program, which works closely with IMPC. As you just saw from Ron, um, we talked a little bit about the atmospheric modeling that's going on. And I know Carl will be talking about the ice and the water quality a little bit later. Today, I'll talk about the model intercomparison project and some of our integrated water resource management modeling that's going on and how that's integrating some of the decision-making uh, scenarios as well as user engagement. So in terms of the water resources management modeling, uh, a lot of this modeling is being directed or led out of the core modeling team, uh, but it leverages work that's under uh, being done under IMPC. There's uh, basically three or four ways that we're really focusing on driving this research for the, for, forward. First of all is to look at network-based routing schemes, which are really designed to be run offline from the hydrology or the runoff and to look at the global or continental scale in terms of embedding lakes and reservoirs into the surface water uh, modules. Then the second way is to actually embed the regulation directly into the hydrologic model and or the land surface scheme. These schemes are designed to be run at the watershed scale. And then last but certainly not least, there's the integrated water resource management models such as ModSim that are really being designed for decision support. So although the three different initiatives uh, or three different umbrellas of initiatives, they really work together to help to provide state-of-the-art tools for looking at water resources in the future and under water resource management. In terms of looking at river regulation being embedded in hydrologic models, uh, the folks at Manitoba Hydro have been working closely with members of my team on this. There's also a separate team from Global Water Futures, uh, Fuad Yassin, who is working on this as well. But the idea is to embed functional reservoir operations models directly into the hydrologic models or land surface schemes. And the idea is that we translate different operational zones where different actions or reactions occur, depending on where the water level is relative to the normal operating range. Uh, and as you can see from the plots on the top right here, it's making a fairly big difference in terms of the model simulations. So the green, is the hydrologic simulation before we added any of the regulation rules into the model. The black is the observed, 
and the red represents the new model uh, with the regulation rules incorporated. So certainly there's a lot of improvement. However, you can see from Lake St. Joseph and the Root River Diversion, there's still some more work to be done. Um, of course, the goal is to make it as simple as possible so that these can be embedded at a global or uh, pan-continental pan scale. Uh, they do use publicly available inputs such as uh, daily flow, inflow, and mean surface area in addition to temperature and precipitation, but we're trying to keep it uh, minimal with inputs in all the models. And then under IMPC, IMPC is directly leading the work on integrated modeling. So the integrated modeling uses decision support tools such as the ModSim model that you see represented here by the different nodes. And it couples that with economic input and output models and decision trees under climate change, which you see in the middle. So those are the drivers of change within a system. And then uh, user interfaces being developed to put all of these scenarios together and allow stakeholders such as yourselves to run different scenarios where you can run it under increasing temperature or decreasing temperature, increasing supply or decreasing supply, and look at the chain of events that occurs. The advantage of using such models like this is that we can really assess the suitability or viability of um, the PPWB master agreement on apportionment uh, or other um, scenarios such as eco hydrologic needs. So in theme B under IMPC, we've developed the model and theme C and D, we're working with the stakeholder community and the user community to develop the scenarios that will drive the model. And of course, the model that I showed you before was the Saskatchewan River Basin, but there's some homegrown work being led by Dr. Masood Asazada out of the University of Manitoba and myself to develop this system, the ModSim model and the decision support tree within the Manitoba boundaries. And the idea is that we will couple this model with the Saskatchewan River model to have um, an entire upstream from the headwaters of the Rocky Mountains all the way downstream to Hudson Bay system that will be able to look at the propagation or the cumulative effects of decision-making. Um, and so of course the challenge in the Manitoba system is the lower Nelson hydroelectric generating complex where there's um, a lot of decisions and a lot of nodes where decisions are being made. Um, but of course it's very important from a transboundary perspective. And an example of what we can do with such a system, this was generated from the Manitoba model um, it's a study that was done by Dr. Kim, um, sorry, Dr. Sujin Kim, uh, Dr. Asazada and myself student who looked at running ModSim under a variety of climate scenarios to look at the changes in um, not only water supply, which is what this is showing, but um, net energy production under a variety of different scenarios, which was done by a summer student of uh, Dr. Asazada's. And so we can actually take a look at energy production as a consequence of climate change. And then there's the work that's being done uh, under theme A, um, A5 specifically for the intercomparison projects. This isn't a goal of seeking out which model is the best, but rather of developing an ensemble of models that can be used to support decision, um, decision making and looking at uncertainty and risk within the systems. There's two different basins that are the focus of this that cumulatively support more than 50% of the water supply within Canada. We are working on the Great Lakes Basin, which is being led by Julianne Mai and Brian Tolson out of Waterloo. And then the Nelson River Basin, uh, Nelson Churchill River Basin, which is being led by myself and uh, my postdoc, Mohammed Ahmed. So I'm just gonna zoom in on the Nelson Churchill Intercomparison Project. So the Nelson MIP is already having an impact on local decision-making. One of the models that's participating within this uh, from strategic consulting, uh, it's a HEC HMS model, is actually um, being used by, by um, as part of the Winnipeg Metro Region Plan for, 2050, for the 2050 um, project. And that's led by Hank Venema and uh, Scott Picorni is, is setting up the model and contributing. So the Nelson MIP is designed to look at change drivers and hydrologic processes uh, within the Nelson Churchill River system. We're at the point now where we're developing the models and submitting the results. And um, just to wrap up, the further development, um, the path forward for IMPC is further development on ensemble approaches for modeling. Uh, to really look at driving these models from climate to hydrology to the water resource management 
uh, and then evaluating the processes and the cumulative effects. Thank you very much. Thanks, Trish. I hate to jump in and, and move on because it's uh, such good detail that everybody wants to, to hear more about, I know. Um, but we're going to have uh, Carl Lindenschmidt continue on with some updates uh, from the Integrated Modeling Program from, for Canada. Uh, so Carl is an associate professor in the School of Environment and Sustainability at the University of Saskatchewan and, and the co-principal investigator for the project. Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, um, I want to maybe concentrate also a little bit on the water quality modeling and also uh, river ice modeling. Um, so um, we've been doing a few basins across Canada, but I'm just going to concentrate on the uh, Saskatchewan River here and the Capel, which both flow into uh, Manitoba. And uh, one thing that we've been looking at, maybe focusing too, is on Lake Diefenbaker and uh, not only looking at its historic water quality, but also um, in the future, for instance, this is here um, during the course of, the, of a year, uh, averaged over these uh, 10 year periods in the future, and also hi historically here. And uh, we can see the temperatures here are getting, will become higher in the top layer of the lake in the epilimnion. Not so much the changes in the, the lower layers, but definitely in the upper layers, which will have an impact on potential blooms, which we'll be also discuss later on in the next uh, in the presentation. And this also, of course, then have an impact on the dissolved oxygen in that lake as well, with uh, longer periods of lower oxygen um, uh, in the upper layer here, and also on, oh, actually on lower as well. So um, one thing I. I that's nice about Lake Diefenbaker. It uh, it serves as a uh, receptacle, I call it, for the flows from upstream, and this is the Upper South Saskatchewan River, and also all the the substances that flow from the upstream catchment in, into the lake. Now, the lake then what, it serves as a nice boundary condition for the downstream. Uh, portion of it, also along the lower South Saskatchewan River. Uh, we do have a water quality model set up for that. And also the um, um, Saskatchewan River Delta. We've been working with the First Nations and Métis uh, people in uh, Cumberland House, uh, looking at how there's three a series of three dams here, Gardner Dam, Francis Finley, and E.B. Campbell how those might be operated uh, to promote a little bit more sediment transport and water through the system to help um, alleviate drying and um, nutrient depletion in the hinterlands of the Saskatchewan River Delta. Uh, then also in um, the, the Capel system, um, we do also have the Buffalo Pound Lake, which can serve also as a um, receptacle or a, a point, a source point here along the Capel River and with um, in-stream water quality malls coupled to that as well to capture also the, the um, processes of uh, nutrient transport into the, the in-lake and in-stream parts of the Capel River. And we are also, there is some interest from Aboriginal groups along the lower Capel River in this work as well. I'm gonna move on to the river ice component now. And uh, we've been working a lot here on the, um, the lower Red River in particular. And um, we can see here a stretch here. This is um, the, portion from Lockport to the downstream boundary here is uh, at Lake Winnipeg. So approximately right here down to, to the Lake Winnipeg. It's a very um, prone to ice jams. This is here, um, ice jam here in Selkirk. Um, 
and this was a fairly heavy ice flood year in 2009. And we've then been able to develop a forecasting system uh, where um, we report on or summarize ensemble runs of here the 10th, 50th, and 90th percentiles of what the backwater level staging could be. For comparison, we also have the, the blue here for the open water without any ice processes, just to see what the impact is of the ice on the staging of, for those for that certain discharge. And this is also work being carried out with Manitoba infrastructure and for hazard now for a flood hazard uh, with um, KGS and um, also the RM of St. Andrews. And um, talking about flood hazard, I, uh, oh yeah, and there's, this is just one river here, but there's also been some work in, uh, in other rivers as well and also being planned, uh, the white mud for instance, um, and the Dolphin River, these, that same methodology for that used for the forecasting has also been applied to them as well. Um, I, what I think also would be interesting too is to um, move on to drought as well. I, I borrowed this from Hank Benema here, which shows sort of a similar trend, although using a bit older data, uh, climate change data here, but showing, showing a similar trend in the drying here um, as uh, Ron Stewart had shown in, in, in his first slide. And uh, I think there'd be um, also room here to use some of these new uh, climate change scenarios that John uh, showed us in his talk to uh, bring that into this work as well. And for that, I'll like to thank you for your attention and would be available for any questions later on after the speaker sessions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carl. I'm gonna ask Chris Spence to get his slides ready. Um, Chris is a research scientist with Environment and Climate Change Canada and also an adjunct professor in the Department of Geography and Planning at the University of Saskatchewan. He is the co-principal investigator of the Global Water Futures Prairie Water Project. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. Um, and thanks Steph and, and John. Um, just here to give a, a, a short outline on what we're trying to do in Prairie Water. Uh, this is one of those uh, user-led um, Pillar 3 uh, projects uh, that, that John talked about earlier. Um, I think at its heart, uh, Prairie Water is a program about improving the resilience of uh, communities across the prairies uh, by uh, uh, by trying to improve uh, knowledge and understanding of, uh, of water cycling. Uh, we've got a, a, a number of different uh, teams in our, in our group, um, uh, subsurface hydrologists, surface hydrologists, uh, uh, geochemists, uh, ecologists, uh, social scientists. Um, I've, I've listed some of the key outcomes there that we've got so far. I won't go into too many details. People can perhaps read those as I'm speaking. Uh, and then some key contacts uh, that we have, uh, we're even on Twitter. And, uh, and you can sort of see in the domain, uh, this is our domain shown here, uh, which is really defined by the, the Prairie EcoZone. Um, I, again, I, so sort of touching on this idea of a sort of a user-led or user-informed research, um, we've really strived since the beginning to, to engage with partners in a big way. And, uh, uh, we've kind of bought into this idea of triple loop learning and, you know, are we doing the right things, trying to figure that out, and then looking at those developing tools uh, for, for prediction of, of water futures to trying to figure out if we're doing things right. And then, you know, really maybe taking a deep look inside ourselves and, and saying, okay, well, do we have the tools and can we be, are we realizing the right things in, this, in the sense that there are, do our, policies and programs do what we want them to do. Uh, and I think we've made some, had some success here. So um, it, it's been a real pleasure for me to work with a lot of partners and, and people 
within this program, it's it's probably been among the most um, uh, fulfilling part of the program. And and some of that is working with social scientists, which I've, I've never really done too much before, which is, so this has been pretty awesome. Um, but uh, I think when some of the work they're trying to do is trying to figure out the motivations behind water management decisions at a, at a variety of different sort of governance levels. Um, and, and this is really proving helpful to the other side of the program, sort of physical scientists like myself and, and some others, to really put our results into context so we can sort of get to that, you know, work our way through these, these loops, these learning loops, to see if we're doing the right things. And, and a really good example of that is, are we getting the desired outcomes from, from wetland conservation policies that do we have or don't have across the prairie provinces? Um, you know, and I just wanted to highlight some of the things we've been doing with uh, uh, the three Saskatchewan communities, Bird Rural Earth, uh, among lots of lots of other partner organizations. But um, some of the work that um, that we've done with these with these folks is has come up with a sort of an indigenous worldview water governance framework, and and that's really helping everybody to sort of co-develop some of our research activities and the decision-making tools that we're, we're starting to develop uh, sort of in the second half of the program. Uh, and an example of this has been something that I think has been really good is um, this uh, a swimmer project um, done in partnership with the North Saskatchewan River Basin Council and, and Mr. Wasses. Um, so it's, it's this kind of stuff that, um, that we've been successful, at least we're starting to be successful with and, and we'd like to see more of. So, it, so uh, a lot of our a lot of our program is uh, is sort of based on, on certain foundations, and, and one of those is a catchment classification we did, uh, led by a fellow named Jared Wolf uh, a few years ago, where we classified four thousand watersheds across the prairies into seven types. And what we do with this is we use that classification to inform some of our integrated modeling. So. What we're building is a series of linked hydrology, biogeochemistry, aquatic ecology, uh, biodiversity and economic models all together based on this classification system. So each one of these seven types is gonna be modeled uh, with this linked system to, to produce its sub outcomes that, uh, that we can hopefully build into some tools uh, that, that will be useful for people. Uh, some of the uh, early outcomes of this, um, has been to a sort of evaluate wetland drainage. Um, and there's there's a lot on this slide. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, addressing some of the questions about the impacts of wetland drainage on, on a number of environmental systems was one of the key questions that our stakeholders wanted us uh, to address. So we tried some things, but there's basically two big take homes from this slide that I'm hoping you could notice is that um, as you increase sort of that nominal percent drained or the percentage loss of, of wetlands uh, within a watershed, um, there's two things that happen. One is that the, uh, the range of flows or annual discharge uh, increases substantially. Dry years stay pretty dry, uh, but the wet years get super wetter. Um, and this kind of variability, if I may, doesn't necessarily need to a system that's more resilient. Um, just because it's always seems to be throwing you a curve, it's uh, varies so much from year to year. Uh, the other thing that um, sort of on the other side of the slide, what tends to happen with wetland loss is that you enhance those flows in such a way that um, you sort of you decrease the return period of, of a given annual stream flow. So what was once the 10 year flood uh, is now the one and two year flood. Uh, and then when we link these to nutrient models, um, what we do find is that uh, with that wetland loss, you just get a nice steady climb. And uh, so in this particular instance, uh, phosphorus load, and, and much of this has to do with just uh, there's that much more water that can leave the landscape uh, versus uh, being stored on the landscape for a little while. Um, so sort of to just wrap things up um, a little bit, uh, we've... Uh, I think we've done a pretty good job with knowledge mobilization efforts through much of the program, but this last year has been, been brutal, right? 
uh, I think people can relate to that. So it's nice to to meet together, uh, even if it's only virtually. And uh, uh, one thing we'd like to do sort of as we get into the uh, sort of second phase of our program is just expanding relationships in, inside Manitoba, uh, whether it be with the provincial government, indigenous communities, the watershed districts or, or ag, ag groups. Um, especially, and I think this is especially important because we're starting to move to sort of uh, building decision-making tools based on our research and uh, that we're not gonna be successful if we don't sort of do this in a co-development kind of way. So um, I'll stop there. Um, uh, thanks Chris. everybody. I hope, I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah, that was good. Thank you very much. Sorry to push you off and on to the next. Um, we're gonna move on to Marin McRae. Uh, she is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Management at the University of Waterloo and is the principal investigator of the Agricultural Water Futures Project. Yeah, so, um, so welcome. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm going to speak today about agricultural water futures. So agricultural water futures is a pan-Canadian study of how agriculture is affected by climate and landscapes, but also how this may shift in future with a changing climate. And we're really focusing on two key agricultural regions. So certainly the Prairie region, so some Saskatchewan and Alberta, but also Manitoba sites, but also the Great Lakes region in Ontario. And we're using both uh, field-based and modeling approaches to answer some key questions, which we broadly put into the three categories that you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. And so we're really asking, how can we learn about crop water use to adapt to changing conditions, um, which again, this is a combination of modeling efforts and field observations. Uh, how can we improve water quality and reduce algal blooms in Canadian lakes? And what are the factors that are affecting farmer decision making? And how can we ensure solutions are cost effective? So this work is mainly in Ontario. So I'm not going to talk about the third one today. I'm really going to talk about the first two today. So I mentioned that there's some modeling and some, some field work. So one feature of the um, ensemble, the, the group that we have, is many a lot of us are field scientists who have been collecting data over many, many years. And so we've really compiled these data sets to take a hard look at what's going on in these agricultural landscapes. So that's been a lot of fun. So uh, just talking a little bit about water availability and, and, and use for crops. So, so there's sort of two key things. There's an improved simulation of agronomic specific indices under a change in climate. So you've heard what some of the anticipated changes are. Well, Yan Ping Li's group has used the wharf model and looked at crop specific metrics comparing the present, which is what you can see on the left-hand side of the screen and a future RCP 8.5 scenario based on um, a pseudo global warming approach. And they did this sort of for Saskatchewan and Alberta, but I think it would be of interest to you in Manitoba. And essentially what they're seeing in future is that we're going to see fewer frost days and more growing degree days because of the warmer temperatures. So that's what you're seeing in the top four panels. But if you look at the bottom, this is going to be accompanied by more plant heat stress. And we're also going to see more water stress in the southern prairie. So this is obviously going to have a lot of significant implications for our crops. Now, another feature that has been part of this uh, group is the work of Warren Helgeson and John Pomeroy's team. And they've been looking at improving modeling capabilities for crop water use and productivity and working with um, CRIM and Aquacrop. So in the field, they've also employed new approaches to understanding evapotranspiration and crop productivity, including the use of drones and field studies that are, and, and they've been examining water use efficiency estimates across a range of crop types and management practices practices. And so they, so if we look at the um, graph on the left hand side of the screen, one thing that they've seen is that snow melt runoff is, or that snow melt is a key driver of soil moisture in this water limited region. And essentially, uh, this is really what gets us through in dry years. So if, if we're moving into a warmer climate with earlier or less snow melt and less snow melt recharge, we're going to see implications for our crop production. 
He's also done some interesting work looking across crop species, crop types, and he's actually found that they can vary considerably in their water use efficiency. So this provides us with some really neat knowledge in terms of potential for uh, tools for adaptation if a farmer, for example, has to make a tough decision in a tough year about achieving a certain amount of biomass for a given moisture level. Um, not only did we find did he find that water uh, use differs with crops, it also really differs within a field. And this spatial variability within a field can actually bigger, be bigger than anything else. So in, in terms of interannual variability or variability across crop types. And so we really need to capture this in our estimates of water use efficiency because it helps put our point estimates into perspective, but it also lends itself nicely to precision agriculture. From a water quality perspective, much of what we've done is determining, we've really been determining the key drivers of phosphorus loss in the prairies, uh, in both the prairies and on and the Great Lakes region, but I'm talking about the prairies today um, since we have a Manitoba, a Manitoba crowd. So one thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the special section on agricultural water quality in cold environments um, led by uh, Jean Lu and others, uh, a postdoc in our AWF team and several other other um, in our team. And there have been several reviews and syntheses that are both in that special issue and elsewhere that are really taking a good look at some of these processes that are drivers. Just to talk about some of the things that have come out, um, this is some work that Henry Wilson had done recently in the special issue. And what he had found is that although we know that across a lot of landscapes that we do see relationships between soil phosphorus and runoff phosphorus losses, a lot of people really look at that top 50 centimeters and what he's finding is that that top five centimeters is a much more important um, predictor of that that loss of phosphorus from the system and so it's that zero to five and the degree of stratification is really really important in the prairies. Um, Jean Lu in the the bottom graph that you can see on the screen what they did is they took a look at uh, Olson P and they really in, in enriched systems and what they did is they reduced they drew down that soil phosphorus over about a five or six year period and they found that it actually had a, an effect on reducing snowmelt runoff concentrations of phosphorus without impacting crop yield. So this is quite promising. The, um, you earlier have been hearing about some of the modeling work that's being done through the projects. There's also been substantial modeling done in this where we're really capturing cold season processes and in our water quality and hydrological models. So Diogo, Diogo Costa, who's now with Environment and Climate Change Canada, has been working with us and the Fluxos and the CRIM Wintra modules have uh, had some significant advancements. The last bit of data that I'd like to talk about has to do with tile drainage. So certainly tile drainage is something that we have a lot of in Ontario and some of the issues in Lake Erie have really been linked to tile drainage, especially in northwestern Ohio. So given the expansion of tile drainage in Manitoba and the ongoing issues in Lake Winnipeg, there's obviously concern about the implications that tile drainage might have on phosphorus mobilization and transfer. And so this is uh, some of the work of Coquillon uh, with myself and David Lobb from the University of Manitoba as well as um, have worked together on this. So and Genevieve Valley. So we have uh, multi year high frequency data sets on flow and phosphorus chemistry in tile drains in the Red River Valley, specifically near Elm Creek, which is what you're seeing here on the bottom, and then also at some sites in Ontario on the uh, on the top of the the screen and what we're seeing is five year three to five year aggregation and we can see what's in the subsurface or tile is in blue surface is in orange and these are simply just their relative contributions and so you, you can see in the bottom two they're both clays whereas the top one is a loam in Ontario Ultimately, uh, what we're seeing is that tile drains uh, do export a lot of the water and a considerable amount of phosphorus in Ontario, but they absolutely play a minimal role in the Red River Valley clay because essentially when most of the water and phosphorus are lost during the snowmelt runoff period, tiles are basically decoupled by that frozen ground. So uh, the long and short of it is that tile drainage isn't really gonna do much to the phosphorus story, but it may enhance nitrogen issues, which has some relevance. 
So just to close, there's uh, contact information for myself and my project, our project manager, Harriet Biggis, and we're also on Twitter, and I look forward to our future conversations. Thank you. Thanks, Marin. We're going to move quickly to our last uh, present presentation, uh, co-presented by uh, Dr. Helen Bulch and Dr. Jason Venkatasaran, and I apologize for not getting that uh, fully correct. Uh, they're going to co-present on um, the, the, um, the project forecasting tools and mitigation options for bloom-affected lakes. Helen is at the uh, University of Saskatchewan School of Environment and Sustainability, and uh, Jason is an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at Laurier. All right, thanks, Stephanie. Um, so Jason and I, as mentioned, we'll talk about some work that we are co-leading, and I'll mention that this is on behalf of about a dozen people engaged in the work, some of whom I think are here today and others who couldn't be here, but um, we're all keen to talk more about the progress, the work underway, and what is needed as next steps. Um, so I think as many folks in Manitoba know, blooms really are on the rise. Um, we see this globally and we see this in, in the prairies. And of course, we know the story of Lake Winnipeg is a very familiar one. Um, blooms have numerous negative impacts. The ecological effects of blooms can be massive with the potential really to impact most or all biota in the lake via effects on factors that include oxygen and clarity. Um, toxin production can lead to major health risks. And certainly we know that human uses can be really seriously affected. We know that um, the prairies are particularly bloom impacted and you can see that here with this image on the left, the graph on the left, which is a prairie lake um, where we get the longest duration of bloom conditions. So the longest pink blob is what you're looking at across all of our Canadian study lakes. And this is because the prairie lakes naturally have pretty good conditions for blooms and human activities are really making those conditions better for blooms, worse for humans. So we have a long period of what I'd call just right conditions where we have adequate nutrients um, and nice warm waters for blooms to develop. Now we know that these just right conditions are becoming more common around the world. The lake on the left at IISD ELA has had near constant phosphorus loading over the period that we're showing. And you see evidence that the bloom period is elongating over time. The reservoir on the right speaks to the risk of extremes. So when we uh, think about flood impacts, we need to think about water quality. A flood here brought in a huge influx of phosphorus. It warmed the um, sediments of a, a reservoir, allowing iron release, and these combined effects um, led to an early bloom emergence far earlier than we're typically prepared for. And then within the prairies more broadly, we know that abundant nutrients and changes in the thermal structure of lakes associated often with low wind periods um, often are exacerbating uh, bloom conditions. So around the world, we're creating these conditions that are really ideal um, ideal for blooms. And one of the major reasons we worry about blooms is because of toxins. Um, these data again are for a prairie lake, which is a key drinking water resource. And we see the diversity of toxins present is really high and it's far beyond microcystin, which is what we typically sample for. Um, so this really highlights with the rapid changes in toxin diversity, the challenges of effective monitoring and the importance of this of effective monitoring to really understand um, changing toxin risk through time. So if we wanna think about bloom risk across Canada, um, we know the diverse toxins we saw really highlight the need to adapt and rethink our monitoring programs and really rethink our risk assessment of blooms and how we communicate those bloom related risks. And we know that multiple sectors are affected, including agriculture, recreation, and of course, drinking water treatment. Um, affected utilities really need robust drinking water treatment systems um, that are uh, resilient for today and then for future risks as well. And all of these sectors need support to adapt. And we've heard this um, 
we've heard about these challenges from our partners uh, and often from um, smaller operators and utilities within the prairies. As we think about risk communications, um, we also need to pay further attention to the audiences that we aim to reach and the audiences that we are currently missing through some of our risk communications uh, strategies. So I think there's tremendous potential here for cross community agency and cross province collaboration, but there's also a really long way to go um, to enhance our communications and management of some of these bloom related risks. So Jason, over to you. All right, perfect. Thanks, Helen. So I'll pick up here then with uh, a way to consider not just adaptation, but also solutions. Um, a fundamental step to mitigating uh, blooms is to minimize nutrient inputs to lakes. So better nutrient management will take time, of course, but ultimately this is the key to progress. Uh, Lake Winnipeg receives you know, nutrients from the entire basin and entire basin's land use. So it's clear how many problems have arisen there, but it's also not unique. Uh, certainly there are many bloom affected lakes in Manitoba, across the prairies and around the world. So in addition to managing nutrients, we also we're at the stage where, stage where we need to understand where direct interventions such as aeration or chemical treatment make sense. And I have pictures of a couple different options here on the right-hand side. Uh, they're costly. They often require continued or repeated treatment. And the question then is, do you do it every five years or 10 years, or do you do it annually, maybe forever? So choosing the right tool is important. And this has been a major motivator for our work to understand the triggers of blooms across the diverse uh, lake types in Canada. We're trying to create uh, transferable knowledge to map those interventions on specific problems. And I've got a little triangle at the bottom here to identify three different key characteristics of lake types across Canada. So we see blooms as being you know, really predictable across lakes. There are a series of factors that contribute to these just right conditions that Helen talked about. This includes the right thermal environment. So we'll move from the bottom layer here all the way up anoxia that triggers the release of nutrients or some adequate nutrient supply. And with this cross lake understanding and a deeper knowledge of how these individual controls work, uh, we can understand how to predict, but also how to interrupt particular, bloom, uh, particular blooms. Uh, the sequence here is key because the sequence is predictable and therefore it may be interruptible. Uh, we do have good news and this is where I'll run, end. Uh, first, we do see in a small shallow lake in Helen, Helen Show Buffalo Pound a little bit, where we have multiple years of sensor data, that the blooms there have an inherently high level of forecastability. This gives us three to four days notice of bloom conditions via the changes in the biomass in the lake. Uh, second, there are many risk management options. They could range from prevention to testing, communication uh, of the risk to direct treatment in some cases. So we need to ensure that managing that bloom risk is actually on the agenda of the people that do risk management. Uh, we're starting to work on some management options and understanding factors like willingness to pay, for example, and perhaps most hopeful of all is there appears to be a glow, uh, growing public awareness and concern, as well as a willingness to act. So I'll wrap up here and say that we wanna highlight that our work really engages some new approaches to in-situ monitoring, and that will enhance our decision-making abilities and our ability to adapt. Our next steps will then really focus on interventions and their suitability to individual lake types. So please reach out to us. Our email addresses are there if you'd like to learn more. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jason. And thanks everybody uh, for those quick updates. I know there's much more detail that you'd all love to go into and that everybody would like to hear about. Um, but we're going to move into uh, a bit of a reaction and some thoughts by a, a couple of partners within these projects. So I will ask um, that uh, Fasaha Undush, who is the direct, executive director of hydrologic forecasting and water management with Manitoba Infrastructure, uh, Dr. Pascal Badiou, who is a research scientist for the Institute for Wetland and Waterfowl Research with Ducks Unlimited Canada, um, and Justin Burns. I'm not sure if you're here, Justin. Justin's a community data research coordinator with James Smith Cree First Nation. Um, I know that there's somebody on the line using an iPhone and I wondered if yep. that was just, I'm here. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. 
glad you're all here. Um, so we really just like to hear from you guys uh, about five minutes each around you know how you're working with uh, the researchers on on the projects that you are connected to, uh, and a little bit about you know how this work is being, uh, uh, how you're you're contributing to helping to make sure that this work is uh, applicable to your work, and and maybe some more about what still needs to happen, and and what are the the science and and decision support tools that uh, that you need to do your work more effectively. And we'll start uh, with Fasaha. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for thank you, Stephanie, for inviting me here. And um, I've been following all the presentations, and I, I was part of uh, the the team since I think 2017 or 2018, and since it started as a partner. And uh, I mean, most of the projects are really very practical, very useful for us, and we've been actively participating on that. Uh, no doubt that Perry provinces need more hydrologic modeling and then never it's going to be enough. Uh, Trish area, like all the team working, and uh, you know, that's a very good initiative. We are part of that. We are we're giving our models to see how uh, they fit into the bigger spectrum as well. Uh, as Carl said, uh, my team also involved in the ICR mitigation works, which, which has always been a, a big, big headache for us. So by the end of the day, um, I'm very positive. We are understanding to the issues, the challenges will be uh, way better and uh, we'll get more tools to, to help us through, through these operations. Um, um, so I've, I've watched everything almost, I can say like every spectrum from drought to flood to water management, uh, reservoir regulation, everything has been part of this study, which is uh, very amazing. One thing if I see where it's missing is um, really that the, the data part, uh, um, there is no streamed line data in Canada. So if you are looking, let's say precipitation data, there is no streamed line precipitation data throughout the country. So uh, so everybody is using every pieces here and there. Uh, we know Environment Canada has all the stations, but there, there, yeah, there are no quality control. Uh, we know CAPA is, uh, a very good initiative, give some good information, but good somewhere and not good somewhere. Uh, so I always look at uh, our counterpart in the US and they are um, they have a very well uh, established network of uh, data, like a very streamlined data. I think that's very important for us for not now, but only for even for the future, uh, as, long as, as we continue to see how events are holding, so it's very important to have that. And the most important thing is when it comes to extremes, like a particular normal day, uh, everything is accurate, everything is right, no problem. But when we are into extreme floods or extreme precipitation or extreme drought, then we start to see all the data is not matching, including uh, observation of forecasted data and so on. Uh, some point, at some point, if some uh, whether it be through global, global water features or so somewhere, if uh, a streamed line data for Canada, from whatever, anybody can access it. Uh, quality control, temperature, precipitation, wind, you know, if those data are available, that could actually help a lot because whatever comes into the models and whatever output from the model eventually depend on the, what how good the data is. And uh, we see a lot of lot of variation from the data depending on how you see how you find it. And I think that's what I say. But in general, I think it's a very good uh, good work and it captures all the water management issue. And I'm very happy to see it. things are going very well. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we'll go to Pascal next. Uh, so thanks, Stephanie, and, and thank you all for inviting me and, and giving me uh, the opportunity to speak on behalf of Bex Limited Canada. Um, the work undertaken so far by Global Water Futures is extremely impressive, both in terms of scale and scope. And I think it's going to be hugely uh, important as, as we move forward, especially with understanding the role of wetlands in the prairie landscape. Um, yeah, and so there's, you know, for example, we've, we've been involved with some of the work with uh, Yan Ping's group out of the University of Saskatchewan, specifically looking at uh, modeling the impacts of climate on wetlands, but more importantly, 
modeling the reverse, the impacts of wetlands on climate. And so some of the work that Yan Ping has undertaken has shown that wetlands, in fact, do have an important cooling and humidifying effect in the prairies. And so that's going to be really important to consider as, as we move forward. And I think some of the work that both uh, John Pomeroy and Chris Spence have, have, have been in have, have been involved with, have been instrumental in, in demonstrating, you know, the value of wetlands in terms of water quality and quantity. And I think we're finally getting to a point where we, where we, you know, generally understand the ecosystem services that those wetlands provide at a watershed scale. And now, uh, and now I think that's going to point to some, some more important questions in terms of now, now that we, now that we have a general understanding <clears throat> about the about the value of wetlands is you know for example we still don't have a consistent methodology for mapping and tracking wetland health they're they're generally not monitored um, and then in addition to that while we while we can generalize about some of the ecosystem benefits around wetlands uh, there is a huge information gap when it comes to the importance of relative wetland size classes if we're thinking about wetland complexes versus isolated wetlands um, or hydrolog hydrologically isolated wetlands versus flow through wetlands uh, and even the different types of wetland classes, you know, specifically if we're talking about, uh, you know, ephemeral temporary wetlands to permanent wetlands. And so those all have different values and provide different services in terms of biodiversity, carbon sequestration, water quality and, and water quantity and trying to, you um, determine those and look at the trade-offs in, in, in terms of how those systems are managed and how they're going to be impacted by both land use change and climate change as we move forward is going to be extremely important. So all that to say that, that, that the work here um, done by Global Water Futures is, is impressive and really important in terms of developing these tools uh, you know, that we're going to be deploying and applying moving forward. Uh, but as all good research, um, you know, it usually winds up producing more questions. Um, so I think there's going to be lots of opportunity in the future to explore some of these questions. And one thing I'd like to highlight is that as a conservation organization working right across the prairies and in fact across Canada, um, we have numerous projects, you know, ranging from small wetlands to large wetland complexes, as well as upland management in terms of looking at forage and, and grazing lands, where I think uh, we would be extremely interested in, in investigating, applying some of the tools that have been developed by Global Water Futures, uh, because we can actually do that in, in a in a fairly rigorous and experimental fashion, uh, that's not always that's not always easily achievable when you're working in agricultural landscapes because landowners need to manage land according to their production schedules, and that, that, that can change from year to year. Whereas with conservation landscapes, I think we can we can probably uh, tackle some of these questions in a much more kind of repeatable um, scientific fashion. Anyways, thanks. Thanks again for giving me the chance to uh, uh, add some comments and, and thank you again to all the presenters. Uh, really interesting work that you guys are all doing. Thanks, Pascal. Um, Justin, a couple of minutes uh, from you. There you go. <laughs> nice to see you. Yep. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I am Justin Burns. I am from the James Smith Cree Nation. I am a former counselor in chief of my community, and I got involved with this program here going on two years uh, this this actual month here. So it's been going good. The, my job in uh, in detail just is about water testing and for nitrate and phosphates in the in the water systems that are coming into the reserve. Back in 2012, we had flooding issues back here in. And it caused a major disruption to our infrastructure out here in our community. So throughout that time, we've had we've had numerous attempts with federal and provincial governments to try and uh, have flow through dollars for our communities to access funds so that we can we can uh, upgrade our our infrastructure that we have out here. 
but through time and everything like that, with all the lobbying that that we had to do here as as leaders, we've come up with a plan that is that we're actually into our fifth phase now. That's that is working to upgrade our roads in the, in the community. But we were also dealing with uh, farmers that were actually uh, trenching into our community to offload their waters that they had that they had on their land so that they can keep their lands a little drier. So all that caused a major uproar within our community to uh, to do something about that. So as chief and council, we had we actually had to go out there and lobby with the government to try and get as much as done as we possibly could. So we came up with a $22 million plan to to upgrade our roads so that we are on the last part of the phase now. So, but yeah, we were dealing with a lot of um, issues with water as our as our reserve is kind of like in a in a bowl system that they that I call it. But we've been working with uh, watershed authorities here over the past few years to uh, to oversee that. Right now we have a we have a we have a problem with the Lake Lenore uh, water that they have going out there. Within a within a period of probably the ten to fifteen years, that lake has doubled in about three to four hundred percent. So they're trying to offload the majority of that water into the Caird River. And as everybody knows, that the the uh, Caird River uh, goes through this community and other First Nations along along the river there, along that river. So that's going to impact Cumberland House. That's going to impact Show Lake. Show Lake Red Earth Cree Nations. So we sat down with the uh, watershed authority to try and come up with a better plan for them to uh, for them to uh, release water somewhere else. But I'm not too sure what the specifics are that on that. So we're just waiting on that. But we've also worked with the watershed authority to try and have a 3D model of our community. So they sent somebody out here and actually did a graph out here for the uh, for the reserve. So we'll have a better picture of that. So I'm not too sure when uh, when that information will be available to the people. But that's my my job out here is to just to collect the data and to forward it off to uh, the participants. Well, my colleagues and I work with the University of Saskatchewan. So it's an ongoing uh, it's an ongoing testing thing that I'm doing here by uh, by myself here in the community. I answer to uh, my colleagues uh, Lalita and also to Lori Bradford. So those are the um, the main the main ones that I that I do my um, data collection for. So with that, if there's any questions that you guys may have about James Smith or any other um, water issues pertaining, I'd be welcome to answer any questions. But thank you, uh, Stephanie, for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments and uh, all three of you for reflecting on the updates by the scientists your ongoing collaborations with them. And uh, we do have a few minutes of about 10 minutes before we need to wrap up for the day, um, but we'll open the floor to some questions or ongoing discussions from any other participants that we uh, have online. You can uh, use the reaction function to raise your hand, uh, you can, uh, I believe you can unmute yourself or I can unmute you on your behalf uh, if you would like to pose a, a, a live question. Do we have anybody who would like to do that? Okay, Hank, I'm gonna unmute you. Oh, there you go. Hi, um, thank you so much, Stephanie, and to all the presenters, uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, it's a question for Marin, and it's, I think it's the, um, Liu et al. 2019 reference, it looks like there's a surplus legacy phosphorus thing going on there. And I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on what you think that that's what's happening, uh, because it is a big deal for Lake Winnipeg, um, nutrient interception, um, nutrient recycling, um, issues. I mean, is there a lot of legacy phosphorus that we need to intercept and remove? Um, okay, so one thing I would like to do is I would actually like to invite Helen Balch to respond as well, because she's a co author on that study. Um, and so I, I think that she is probably in a better position um, to discuss the prevalence of legacy P or just how, how widespread it is. Hmm. 
Okay. Yeah, it's a, a good question. I mean, that's a, a paper from a limited area, so it speaks to conditions in a specific field, and I don't have the data at my fingertips in terms of how widespread it is. Um, if we think about targeted management, it's definitely a real opportunity, and we even have um, one producer we've been interacting with in Saskatchewan who's done swap mapping of his own fields and sees the same hot spots in areas, and often it happens when there's continued inputs without testing and low production in a certain area. So sometimes it's a semi-saline area, an area that's too wet, too dry, et cetera. So um, it would be not the most common condition, certainly. It's not like where you need to draw down all of the soils of the prairies. There's a lot of areas that actually have relatively low phosphorus, but if we think about targeted management, this is one area that we think is strategic to try to approach. And and I know Tom Rolls must have been on, through the, um, Fertilizer Canada and the International Plant Nutrition Institute has done a lot looking at soil phosphorus throughout the landscape. And so I think I think I, I would concur that there are set, certainly some enriched landscapes, but there's an awful lot of land that's really not super, super high. And I and I think once you get down into those low points, um, it's it's a lot harder to draw things down without having a yield response. So I think that's just an important piece to to keep in mind. OK. Thanks a lot. Thanks for that. I don't see any more raised hands in uh, the participant box, but if you do have a question, please either raise your hand or make a chat note and we can unmute you. In the meantime, um, I'm wondering if any of the researchers that uh, we have online want to um, make any further comment or uh, expand on anything that they feel like um, maybe they missed in their time allotment uh, or build on anything that uh, was presented by other, your, your colleagues. Helen, I see you turned your camera on, but maybe it was just still on. I see Trish has too, so Trish. I'll, I'll pass to Trish in a second, but I was gonna say we should probably enter our email addresses into the chat or make sure we distribute them because I know lots of questions are likely to come later on as well, but Trish looks like she is something. Yeah, and, and just before that, um, I did circulate to all participants a kind of a two-pager with a, a high-level summary of all the projects that participated today with the web addresses and contact um, emails. Yeah, I was just going to say that IMPC is always interested in knowing what scenarios stakeholders are interested in. So if anybody is um, wanting or thinking about IMPC scenarios uh, that might be of use to them, then you can reach out to us. Great. Um, just building on that, Trish, uh, are there scenarios mm -hmm. that you're, um, you know, maybe want to call for or what have you been, you know, running already that... Mm -hmm. you know, what, what are the gap areas maybe? Yeah, well, there's certainly like the typical climate and water use scenarios, but I think the most important ones that are really like a little bit more subjective and we want to be rooted in what stakeholders need are the agricultural based scenarios. Um, and the like Pascal was alluding to wetlands and the connectivity between them and the link with agriculture. I think even having a conversation around that and how agriculture can sometimes replace some of the naturalized wetland areas might be really interesting to test out. Um, so things like that. Okay. And Carl, you wanted to? I guess maybe just a, a request for to uh, Fisaha, if you're still on the line, Fisaha. Um, yes, I am. Yeah, hi. Um, nice to see you again. We, uh, we, Fisa and I, we worked in the same office for a while back, 2009 to 2012. Yeah, so um, go back a ways a bit. Um, you know, I, we've been working with Ben on this flood forecasting of the Lower Red River, and we're moving this now to to an outlook, not just a forecast, but to to an outlook. I know that's something that's very important for you. Uh, one thing what we could use, and I, I think Ben sent one this year, but if we could next year think, if you could think of us and uh, share your a hydrograph of that outlook, not just the peak flow, but the hydrograph, would that be possible? Yes, it's possible. You know, knowing that the hydrograph 
at the outlook will have so many uncertainties. You know, yeah, we can know. give you with the bound, like upper decile, lower median. So we can oh, generate be, those three. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. So okay. I think that's a good thing and it's outlook will be very useful. Maybe. Okay, great, super. Thanks yeah, a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And let us know if you need any other thing, you know. We are yes, you bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Um, I see um, Justin has his his hand raised. I can invite you back. There you go. Yep, I just want to know if anybody has any information pertaining to industries that are coming out to traditional territories. As, as of right now, we, we've been dealing with Shore Gold and also with Rio Tinto, a diamond exploration company that's, that's embedded right now in, our, in the heartland of our traditional territory. So uh, they're getting permits signed as, as we speak to, uh, to offload some of the waters that they're having. So with that kind of offload of water that they're, that's going to be impacting not only here, it's going to be impacting communities, like surrounding communities, as well as going down for, further from the river, maybe into Manitoba area. Because the main aquifer that they're, they're, they're trying to go on is under our aquifer that we utilize for our fresh drinking water. So there's going to be a lot of um, EIS studies going to be done here within the past, within the past little while here. So that's going to be a, a problem I see in the near future for future generations that are going to that are going to have access to good quality, safe drinking water. So those are the kind of issues that that I'm that we're facing here in our in our community. So it's an ongoing fight that we have here as First Nations people in in this process. But also, like I I just like to take this time to say thank you for for allowing the First Nations part of this to be part of this project. It's always a welcoming um, experience to be part of such an ongoing big big project like this. So uh, with that, I just wanna say thank you for your for all your, your wisdom and all your knowledge on keeping everything up to date. So on behalf of myself and our people here, we just wanna say thank you. Thank you so much, Justin, and thank you and uh, your community for uh, coming to work with uh, the researchers within the Global Water Futures Program, and and uh, you know really being an ambassador for your community and uh, and playing an important, very critical role in the research process itself. So thank thank you. Um, I think with that, uh, we do have to end right at uh, at the top of the hour. John, I just wanted to um, give you a final wrap up word if you would like. I uh, yes, I'll, I'll do it very quickly. Uh, I want to thank our participants from Manitoba and, uh, and, and other areas and, and also for the researchers uh, for coming together with this uh, information. It's, it's critical for us to get this feedback. And so please, uh, please write to us if you think we're on track, if we're missing things we want to hear. Um, there are still some years left in the program uh, till 2023. And we will also are looking at how we can extend the program and, uh, and can carry on because there's all those new things that we discover. So uh, we're keen to hear from you uh, as we move forward. And um, we're also keen for members for the user advisory committee. And, um, and so uh, contact uh, myself or, or Stephanie or Fanny Adapa uh, for uh, uh, gaining membership on that if it's of interest to you. So I'd like to thank you all so very much and um, call to a close. Great, thanks, John. And folks were wondering about recordings. Uh, I will circulate the recording to everybody who registered today. So watch for that in your email. Until then, have a good rest of the week and I'm sure we will be engaging again at a later date, hopefully in person. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, thank you, bye-bye. Thanks everyone.